welcome. It's the FIH Pro League Hockey Show. And uh, it's a, well, we've got a debutante appearance today from Dan Strange. And I do feel under a slight amount of pressure as he's an expert commentator on the game. Uh, Dan, good afternoon to you. Hello, how are you? Yep, really, really good. And thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we've got a second appearance by Australian superstar Trent Mitten. Hi, Trent. How are you today? Going well. Thanks for having me back. Absolute pleasure. Um, and I hear you had a successful uh, day with your club yesterday um, over in over in Holland, yeah? No, well, a non-successful day. A non-successful unfortunately. day. But <laughs> uh, it's the best of three, so we still have two more games to go. Well, good luck with those. Um, yeah. Okay. So before we start talking about the um, yeah, the Pro League action, I wonder if we just quickly touch base on the Australia New Zealand four match series that's just taken place. Um, Trent, we've seen four matches with Australia women taking on the Black Sticks women. Um, two draws and two wins to Australia. So Australia will obviously be feeling the happier of the two sides. Um, what are your take on those games and, and what those results will mean to the two teams as they are finally getting some international action? Yeah, that's it's, that's almost um, a more important point than the results of the games, just the New Zealand and Australia being able to play international hockey again. Um, just the last two years has just been scarce with games um, for the two teams, unfortunately, the men and the women. Um, but the results, I imagine the Hockey Roos would be really happy with. They had four debutantes, I think. Um, not very high scoring, but again, they'd be stoked with the results, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... For New Zealand, um, this is also a case of a new coaching team in place as well. So it's going to be doubly, um, well, I was going to ask you, actually, is it going to be doubly tricky or is it actually going to be a honeymoon period for those guys? We've got Darren Smith stepping in. Obviously, Shay McAleese, one of our uh, regulars on the show, is also there. Um, is it w- With the team, is it good to have a new coach because you get new, fresh impetus? Or is the reverse of that, that you've got so much to get used to, you know, with a very short space of time before the World Cup starts? Yeah, good question. I think it's always, um, I reckon there is a honeymoon period. I reckon everyone steps in with a new coach and there's a definite freshness feeling, um, sort of nothing to lose. Um, I think the coach is always quite relaxed as well because um, they've just been given the role and they're excited about the games ahead. So I think there's a, a great period there where um, New Zealand girls can just, um, yeah, enjoy the hockey, enjoy playing with each other. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways pressure's off a little bit, isn't it? Because yeah. you know, if they if they go ahead and win the World Cup with a new coaching team, everybody will be amazed. If they don't, it will be there will be an excuse there, so that's fine. Um, Dan, just before we start talking specifically about Spain and Argentina, um, I know you've commented on a, a commentated on an awful lot of the Pro League games to this point. And one of the comments um, that came a couple of weeks ago was that you felt that many of the women's teams are still looking for their um, ultimate combinations of play. Is that still the case, do you think? You know, as you're sort of looking around the teams that are going to, how many days have we got left to go? You were saying it a lot uh, yesterday. It was, 40, it was 46. It was 47 yesterday. I seem to do a daily countdown. It, you know, obviously it counts down every time we do a new match. Yet, to a degree, I Simon and I were talking about this on the commentary at the weekend. My gut feeling is, and I'm slightly happy to nail my my uh, views on with this, is I actually think Argentina are looking really good. I, I didn't think they had a great weekend. Obviously, they uh, they won both matches. But what they've got is just so much talent across that team in abundance. With the rest of the teams, I, have, I haven't done much in the Netherlands this year. So, um, you know, I'm not going to comment there. And we all know, obviously, how good the Netherlands are. I mean, it's it goes without saying. Um <laughs> I think teams like England are very much in the early stages of their development. So they're taking time. India, for me, look good. Um, obviously, they've had the consistency with Seward leaving, but Yannicka stepping in. They, to me, look in a good place. But yeah, I, I would say a lot of the other teams, you sort of don't really know what you're getting. Obviously, with Spain, Adrian probably offers the most consistency of any team in the world to a degree. Um, so that helps, as Trent's just said, you know, the sparse tier games for Australia and New Zealand leaves question marks there. You know, so, yeah, I, th- I think most are, but Argentina look very, very good. Yeah. And I mean, that moves us nicely onto the onto the games that we saw this weekend. Um, Spain women will be disappointed. I think it was zero one zero one to Argentina. Uh, Trent, what were your what were your thoughts on those two women's games as you, as you watched them? You know, what, what did we see unfolding there? Yeah, it was interesting. Like. It was um, quite um, tightly contested, obviously very low scoring, um, just the one goal separating them each, each time. Um, 
Spain's, I think, biggest issue heading into the World Cup will be their ability to score goals. Um, and you can defend all you like, but at the end of the day, it's how many goals you put you, you put into the net that really counts. Um, the one big thing I noticed was that that goal that Argentina scored um, by Granato was obviously a very good finish, but more than anything, it came directly after a Spain penalty corner. Mm-hmm. So it seemed they had a bit of momentum and then they let, let it slip for a moment and Argentina went down and, and knocked the goal in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the two Granata girls, that, that was a fantastic combination and they just seem to be getting more and more into the squad. I mean, um, Dan, you said yesterday that um, Victoria was almost an overlooked player in that squad because there's so much talent there. Um, I, I think I, I get the sense that you're oozing with enthusiasm about the Argentinian squad. Tell me what you saw at the weekend. I I've done a lot of their games this year. I did a lot of the matches from the Senard earlier on in the year. They're exactly what you said there. What I what I like with them is obviously you've got Jan Kunas, you've got Albatari, you've got Maria Granato, who we all know how exciting they are to play or to, to watch and uh, and the way they go about it. This weekend, I we said I don't really think the men's or the women's teams for Argentina quite linked those the four forwards that they have that fit into the three uh three forward roles. Vicky Granato, for me, though, the, it's the link-up play with her and her sister, which is amazing. They, they're just on a great wavelength, as you would expect, um, with siblings. She's still really exciting. It's just almost people don't think she's as exciting. So in that way, people leave her alone more because they're worried about how Albertario is driving you know, down the line and how tricky Maria Granato is. And uh, seriously, some of her skill, skill levels this year have been, been unbelievable. But yeah, no, I, I very much think with with Vicky, she's almost the sort of the dark horse for them because teams leave her alone. And what she scored now, I think it's four in five games, I think, and, counting yeah. in yesterday. Um, so yeah, I think they're, 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 they didn't quite click from this weekend. And I, I think going back to what Trent said about momentum, talking about Spain, for me, if you look at the games where Spain have had momentum, they've done well. So you look at the early game they play or the early couple of games they played against the Netherlands, in Bubanesha against India, they scored, when they got on a roll, they scored some stunning goals in that match um, and really sort of scored them on the break as they tend to do. There was the one that the volley lift into the corner of the goal, which for me is well one of the goals of the season, if not the goals of the season. When they get that momentum, they're very, very good at continuing it. I think uh, Gigi Oliver coming back in for the second game yesterday shows how much they need her for the sort of, yeah. The structure and the positivity, not just in defence, but going forward as well. I mean, that is one of the strengths of Spain, isn't it? Picking up in midfield and driving forwards. And as you say, Gigi Oliver, her amazing ability to pinpoint a pass uh, to one of the forwards. Um, we, I, I don't want to highlight one player's, um, uh, shall we call them failures in this weekend, and I'm sure she'll have much better games in the future. But we saw Sara Bar- Barrios miss a few goals. Um, and one after them in the first game, she had this chance where she'd received the ball. She'd done absolutely everything right. But then she had so much time that her decision making went all awry and she ended up just scuffing the ball. Um, Trent, as as a player, how how on earth do you overcome those moments? You know, how how do you get yourself into a point where um, the decision making doesn't cloud your mind, but actually you have you have a clear vision as what you're going to do next? Yeah, it's often the it's often the most difficult thing, especially as a forward, where perhaps you only get one chance during the game. So you need to make sure that chance is really, really high quality. Um, I always go back to a few things, especially playing up front, is that you've got to make sure that the last thing you do is the best thing you do. So don't worry about too much about anything else beforehand. Make sure if you're pushing the ball in the goal, you focus 100% on pushing that ball exactly where you want to push it. Um, or if you're focusing on the trap inside the circle, don't worry about anything else. Just trap the ball and then the rest will take care of itself. Um, too often, I think, especially with younger players, uh, they get caught up in so so much in what's going on around it's like oh, i'm going to trap it here then i'm going to backhand it and hopefully it goes on this side and i don't know where the players are um i found it's really handy just to focus especially just on one thing one basic thing to start with um and then the rest will take care of itself yeah i mean a couple of players who really don't have a problem with their decisiveness are um the two augustines from um argentina so we've got uh, albertario her strength when she scored that goal was incredible wasn't it i mean she she there was no way anybody was going to stop her and she um you know turned her back then turned and shot dan that was that was a, a really impressive look at a powerful player wasn't it yeah, and I mean, she hadn't scored in a number of games right coming into that one. So that she scored against England, that lovely yeah. drifting run. 
and she just stuffed it in the bottom left hand corner. But again, talking about the sort of decisiveness, that's exactly when she gets her chances. That tends to be how she is. She makes it's not always the right right choice, but she makes a decision and she sticks to it. And that was slightly where Barris at the weekend I felt was caught in two minds with things quite often. She had one where she actually looked over the goalkeeper's shoulder to put the ball in the top right-hand corner. And because she sort of was, do I cross it? Do I do that? Mm. With Albertario, what I like with how she plays is whether it's her shooting or her running at players, and it tends to be down the left-hand side, as you said, it's always decisive. It's always trying to be as positive and put Argentina on as much of a front foot as she can. Sometimes it goes wrong. She tends not to worry too much in that case. If it goes wrong, she, as Trent said, she shrugs her shoulders and moves on to the next game. But equally, she's at a different stage in her career. Um, I remember covering her in Valencia in 2015 at the Hockey World League semi final. Yeah. I think it was a Great Britain one. Um, it was a lovely two weeks in about 30 degree sunshine. And, and there she was a much younger player. She might have responded differently there. I think she only sc- she scored three goals there um, early on and then didn't score for the rest of the tournament. So maybe we're just seeing the sort of her maturity coming through as well. Yeah, I like her arrogance. I mean, I know sometimes the word arrogance is used negatively, but I think her arrogance on the pitch is is, is a very positive thing for the team. The just one one last player I just wanted to quickly talk about um, is um, Agustin Gorzolani, who, as we know, is a fabulous penalty corner specialist. But I thought yesterday's match in particular, we saw her defensive qualities. Um, in in spades. I mean, she she again decisive defending. She took the ball and she took it away from the goal and away from danger on, on several occasions. Trent, I don't know if you if you sort of spotted her her performance and have got any comments on that sort of all roundedness of a player who, who's coming into her prime. Yeah, I think it's a uh, um, something really really important about players coming through at the moment, especially um, playing at the highest level is that you need to have that flexibility. If you're, you can't just be a good penalty corner specialist these days. You need to have other aspects of the game or you get found out. Um, and especially a player of her quality that can go forward, reads the play, as you says, to, is really, really decisive in what you do. Um, makes my job a lot easier as a forward. If I know defenders are going to be decisive with their passing or their tackling, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to play with that, those sort of players. Yeah, I mean, and it's also um, the case that they had a, um, Argentina had their second um, goalkeeper in yesterday. Um, so it might have been that actually Gozolani was taking quite a mature and responsible leadership role in the circle as well to give her goalkeeper more confidence as well, which is which is great. Um, before we move on to the men's game, uh, just put yourself, um, if you would, both of you into the shoes of the two coaches. Um, if you were Adrian Locke, uh, we've already mentioned goal scoring. Is there anything else you'd be looking to really tighten on up before the uh, before the World Cup and for the rest of the Pro League? Um, Dan, I'll come to you on that one. I don't think Adrian will be panicking because I think he will have seen what they can do when they get it right. And I think he is so, he's he's such a steady coach and he's such a thinking coach. All, all coaches are thinking coaches. I, I know that, but he you know he's he's got such a long term plan for this team. But he has also seen what they can do and, and how they can do it. And the fact they're going into this World Cup on home soil, mm. I think that for them is a, is a massive benefit. I don't think he'll panic. I think he'll just want to build now over the next month and maybe start to take a few more risks, a few more balls from Gigi Oliver and, and players like that. Obviously, he's going to have to work on the confidence of some of the strikers. Um, as far as Fernando Ferreira can be concerned, the team have won eight in a row. I think if if I remember right, and I had one on to yesterday's statistic, that's 14 wins in the last 15. And the only match they've lost since last July was the Olympic gold medal match. So what do they worry about? They just worry about keeping the momentum going and actually just getting those forwards sparking and working together. Well, I think mm-hmm. it's there's not much more Argentina can do than kind of keep that juggernaut going. Yeah. Trent, do you think um, Argentina can defeat the Netherlands? Without getting um, uh, lynched think, in the Netherlands where you're living right now? <laughs> I think they're going to have a pretty hard task at doing that. Um, but it does seem to be that gap widening again where it was so long ago with Holland and Argentina being the top two in the world and then a bit of a gap to the rest. Um, it does seem like Argentina are getting that quality back in their group, which is pretty exciting to see. Um, and it'd be awesome to see them challenge the, the Dutch girls um, over here in, in Holland and Spain. I'd be very much looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, 
Yeah, me too. OK, let's turn our attention to the men's games. Um, in the first match, Argentina won 1-0, thanks to a, a poacher's goal from Thomas Domine. And then the second match was a 1-1 draw with um, a shootout that seemed to go on for quite a long time. Um, if we come to you first, Trent, um, you know, we were expecting some high tempo games and sure enough, they were high tempo. But where were the goals? Yeah, it seemed like they um, they just weren't going to come at it at any stage there. And it took a just a skill error out of nothing, really, um, in the centre of the field for Domino to score that, that backhand goal. Um, but as I say, like the, both teams were, were having a crack at it, but it just seemed like the ball just did not want to go in that goal. And 1-0 again um, still counts as a win, but the spectators, I think, would have liked a few more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Dan, you you were sitting, you know, there um, just talking about the match with Simon. Were the pair of you pulling your hair out as you watched, you know, a circle entry after circle entry come to nothing? To a degree, I think it was. They were two games perfectly set up for Trent Mitten to step in, free the team, and uh, mm-hmm. and do a job there. He's got mm-hmm. a hat full in them. Uh, yeah, yes, and no. They they were kind of frustrating games. They they were weirdly enjoyable at times, but as was said on commentary. They also kind of drifted a bit at certain points in the game. And we we actually saw that with Argentina over in our, over in Buenos Aires, where because of the style of play, the, the way they set their stall out, if they're, you know, if they're in the lead, they can almost allow a game to drift mm. because they're not too worried. You know, they sit through Cecilio. He played very well yesterday, yeah. Cecilio. Um, and I don't think we can really have a go at him for not scoring too many because he tends to be busy at the other end. But... Yeah, it, it was quite frustrating to a degree, more so because of the quality of the players on show. And you kind of expect Ferrero, Casea, Manini, who did score yesterday, granted, to be sort of offering more chance, make manufacturing more than they did. I think the fact they got into the circle, but they just didn't really test the keepers too much. I think it was um, quite a testimony to the um, Spanish team in the second game um, that they'd had all of that pressure and they hadn't scored. And then I think possibly their first attack in I don't know how many minutes Argentina did score through Casella, as we said. Um, at that point, I was expecting the Spanish heads to go down. So there's, there must be a lot of strength within that team, um, Trent, in terms of mental strength and resilience for them not to allow that to happen, to bounce straight back. And on the back of that, how pleased do you think uh, Manini was to have uh, scored against his old team? Yeah, it was interesting. Having played a lot against both Argentina and Spain, I can tell you that their defences are extremely good and they're very hard to score against. You never see either of those teams getting blown away. Mm. Um, and it's it's always the way when we had played against them, when I played against them, in that regardless of how many circle entries, how many attacks, they just find a way to keep the ball out of their net. Um, so it's a credit to both of them and something that um, I think they'll be very happy with. Um, in terms of the, yeah, the, the goals themselves, I mean, um, again, the comment is that Argentina scored and um, straight away Spain went down the other end and scored a goal. So it's about how you restart after that that goal being scored. They weren't concentrating. Spain just went straight down and, and Manini had the ball right in front of the net. Classy finish, um, but definitely had to put it in. As, as someone who's sort of, you know, as you say, you've played against the teams a lot. Uh, you also know Max Caldas. So far, I mean, he's, he's been with the Spanish team for, I think, nearly two years now. Can you can you see his influence coming through on that squad? Because they're a squad that have promised a lot for a long time, but I don't feel that they've ever quite fulfilled that potential. Are we starting to see Max as influence on the team now? Yeah, I think Max as a coach, he he is really good at identifying young talent. Um, and he, he'll have, he loves skillful players. Um, he loves players that are going to be really, really classy at finishing the ball in the goal. Um, and Manini is obviously a good example of that, having played against him over here. He plays for Rotterdam. Um, same with Casaya as well. I mean, such a, a good player for Argentina. Um, but yeah, back on your point of Max, I think um, these things do take time as he was came into the head coaching role yeah, last year. So these things take time. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the, in the future. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, obviously the men's teams have got a lot longer um, before the... Um for the World Cup, so they've got a lot more experimentation to do and everything. But um, in terms of um, Argentina, you know, they're, they're second in the Pro League at the moment. Um, but to challenge the top spot, Dan, come to you again. What do they need to What do they need to improve upon? Do you think to sort you know to move up there to the top spot of the Pro League? I, I for me again, it's a. It was two things from yesterday which they've shown earlier in the season. With One thing I will say with Argentina is, of course, they 
because a lot of the players didn't play against South Africa, that it's kind of become a bit disjointed for them over the last month because mm. they only had three players available for those matches, the ones based in, in Argentina. Um, really, it's though that front four, three, four into three again and how they play and how they fight. But equally, you haven't seen Casea much. No. Um, I think building his form equally, Augustin Madzil is only just coming back, and Trent knows all too you know all too well over the years about about Augustin and how he plays. One thing that was commented on the weekend was has his style and positioning within the team played, uh, but sorry changed, and how he plays within that team. The one thing we commented on right at the first match against Belgium was, are we going to see a different way of Argentina playing? I don't think we've seen a different sort of game plan from them. They've just obviously had a mass change of personnel. They've mm. lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of caps. But what they have brought in is the likes of Ferrero and players like that who have just stepped up to another level. Acosta, Nicolas Keenan as well. Yeah. Players like that who, I mean, Acosta was out this weekend, I think, because he's, I'm assuming he's still injured from the uh, knock he got against South Africa. But there are players within that team that have stepped up a level. And I think the way they then push on in the World Cup or heading up to the World Cup is they have just they have to go up another level. And that's mm. is whether they can do that. Yeah, absolutely. If you were to choose um, a couple of players who would be the first on your team sheet from those uh, those two squads that are out on the pitch at the weekend, who would you uh, who would you pick? Trent, who would who would make it onto your team sheet from either Spain or Argentina? Um I'd always have um um, Tyus Ray, he was playing again for Argentina, like such a classy player and always hated playing against him. So I think it'd be pretty cool to, to be on the same team as him. Um, and yeah, I think Kaseya as well, to be able to play up front with him, I think it'd be pretty cool. Um, and I think he's primed for a pretty big World Cup coming up. Yeah. He's had a lot of, a number of years now, some solid international hockey. I think a uh, big tournament coming up could be a great opportunity to see some pretty awesome things. Would you would you have the audacious uh, Ferreira on your team? I, I, you remember the shootout attempt where he attempted to lob it over the keeper. Had it gone in, he'd have been a hero. See, the shootout, what a great opportunity to, opportunity to try some of that stuff. It seemed like both teams had, had tried every shootout they'd ever practised and gone, OK, well, I'm going to try something different now. Yeah. And, and I mean, that that is, sorry, I'll, I'll come to you, Dan, in a minute for your, for your uh, player choice. But that is a very, very good point. I mean, that there have been questions on social media about should we have penalty shootouts when there are draws and bonus points at, at stake or does it become too much? But actually, it's such a great opportunity to try these things, isn't it? And uh, it's hugely entertaining. I mean, I, Dan, Dan, you probably ran out of uh, superlatives or, or things to, or, or the opposite <laughs> with, the, with the attempts. But it is, it's, a, it's an integral part of the game now, isn't it? And a great thing to practice. I, I, I love it in the Pro League. I love, I love that they have the shootout. I was... Uh, I think I questioned it coming into the Pro League. I thought, oh, you know, it doesn't need to be that sort of American sport format was how I viewed it originally. Now it, it creates an intensity towards the end of the games, whether it goes to a shootout or not. I've learned not to, you know, on a match that's two all or one all or whatever, go, oh, this is definitely going to the shootout because we've seen it with, well, I know India did it twice where I think I said with 30 seconds left, this is going to shoot out Harman Preet or one of the defenders at the back played the ball forward and India scored it with eight seconds left on the clock. You know, it's it does just build that real extra meaning to the end of the game for the teams. And, and yesterday, partway through, I think it was the third quarter, we said that it felt like the last 60 seconds. But then actually, when you get to the last 60 seconds, it ramps up again and it goes even even more. And the team, in fact, yesterday's second, the second men's match yesterday was the only game I've had in ages where actually it slightly petered out in the last 60 seconds. But that is so rare at the moment because there tends to still be something to play for in some way. I mean, actually, the the, um, the the moment in the second match was the 49th, 50th and 51st minute, wasn't it, when it went uh, absolutely <laughs> frenetic. Uh, so come on, Dan, who, who would you put on your team sheet? I'm going to agree with Trent on Casea because I think he's excellent, although I really do like Lucas Martinez and Ferrero, but I'm going to go Casea. And for me, the other player, Ray, absolutely superb, but for the way he has stepped in to some pretty big boots at the back, I'm going to say Cecilio, because I think the way that they're making the game tick through him at the moment is actually freeing up the likes of Ray, yeah. um, which I think is vital for Argentina. 
Brilliant. Thanks. Um, we've got some, well, we've got a huge amount of matches coming up in the next few days, um, some of which I know you're involved in with the commentary, Dan. But uh, um, just quickly whiz through those, have a quick look at them. China women versus Argentina. Now, we haven't seen the China women's team for ages. That's going to be interesting, uh, to say the least. What, what, what are your thoughts, Dan, on that one? It, I haven't had a look at a team sheet or a squad sheet of who's coming when I did the two matches in Muscat at the end of January, just after the Asia Cup, which was against India, and it was, if I remember rightly, 7-1 and 2-1. It was, the 7-1 was the one with all the penalty strokes in. Yes. Um, of course, that was a totally different team from the team that had played at the Asian Champions Trophy. So it's slightly difficult to know which China, what China team literally are going to turn up. They, they sometimes send a provincial team, the, normally the national champions, so slightly with China, it's a case of who knows. However, the one thing I just had a flick back through is, of course, they're now going to play 14 matches in the next 40, uh, 41 or 42 days because they literally finish their pro league on, I think it's the 26th of June. So we're going to go from not knowing much about China to knowing an awful lot about <laughs> China quite everything. quickly, which actually could really play into other teams' hands because they're going to get a real look at the team that you're assuming is going to be the team that set foot for the World Cup yeah. um, in terms of how Argentina do against them that'll be interesting because are they able to do what they didn't do against Spain exactly um, then we've got Spain versus France um, in the men's uh, league Trent what, what, what are your thoughts there that's going to be quite a classic I think yeah I think it will I think France have already shown that their their willingness to play free hockey and play some pretty exciting hockey um, already in the games I've played so I reckon there's going to be a few more goals in those games than, the, than we saw in the Argentina-Spain. Um, and, yeah, I like I like watching France. They're, as I said, they're exciting to play. Um, mm. So it'll be a good test, their attack against the, the stingy Spain defence. <laughs> and obviously you've got Fred Sawyer there in charge as well, who's going to know the Spanish team very, very well. Um, the, the other matches, uh, Belgium are back in action. Uh, men and women will be taking... In fact, Spain are very busy because they've got Spain... Uh, sorry, they've got Belgium men and women. Uh, then we've got just one I want to quickly mention, Germany men versus Argentina men, where we'll see Gonzalo firing some uh, penalty corners at his old team very, very quickly. What are your thoughts on that, Dan? Uh, the, the question that we came up with at the weekend was there are four gold medalists still playing international hockey from 2016 for Argentina, uh, from that team in 2016 when Argentina won it. Of course, two were playing, Ray and Madzilli. They face the other two this week because they've just played Manini and they've got Gonzalo to come uh, next week. He's taken to pro league hockey well, hasn't he? You know, albeit in a different shirt. I mean, the thing with the, the thing for Gonzalo Payat is he's gone from Argentina, who knew exactly how to play for him to create the opportunities, to Germany, who will be able to do exactly the same. It's a diff difficult one to call. I'll leave Trent to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It's, it's almost the piece that Germany has been lacking the last few years, like mm. a really, really high quality um, penalty corner since first and moved on. Um, they've been missing that piece. So it seems like Pelia could be a, a pretty interesting piece in, the, in their team and they'll be doing everything they can to make it work with him there. Um, mm. I think in the, in the schedule coming up, there's going to be a lot of international hockey because the playoffs here in Holland are going to finish. The playoffs in Belgium have recently finished. So those Dutch and Belgian teams are going to play a lot of hockey. Um, and obviously all the European teams are going to have a lot of international hockey coming up before the Women's World Cup and then the Men's World Cup later this year. So there should be a lot going on. There's a huge amount going on. Just log on to the FIH website to get all the fixtures because there is an awful lot, as we say, going on. Uh, we'll be back next week with the show to talk about all of those matches. But in the meantime, thank you so much to my two guests today, uh, Dan Strange and Trent Mitten. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, guys.